Hello and welcome to another edition of the Mexican Soccer Show. I'm your backup host, Cesar Hernandez, and we're here to talk about Juan Carlos Osorio. We're here to talk about El Tri. Might even talk a little bit about the Europeos, maybe some Liga Mekis, uh, maybe even some cats, since uh, Andre was telling me, you know, right before the show started, that maybe we should have a little poll to see whose cat is better, but we all know it's DJ Cuddles. And uh, maybe maybe about maybe about dogs too, right, Tom? You, you, you have a dog, so... Uh, Maybe that's something we'll be talking about later on this show. So before we get into cats and dogs, maybe a little bit of soccer, <laughs> let me first introduce our guest today. So we have Andrea Canales over in L.A. from uh, ESPN FC. Andrea, how are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Good. Yeah, here, just ready to talk about cats. Like I said, maybe we'll talk about soccer <laughs> in the end. We'll, we'll see what happens. A little bit of soccer, mostly cats. Yeah, yeah. Mostly. With the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we also have Tom Marshall, also for ESPN. I just realized right now this is the it's like the ESPN FC podcast between the three of us right now. In- yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's not exclusive. We're shutting yeah, everyone else out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Marshall in Guadalajara. How are you doing, Tom? Yeah, not bad. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Cesar. Yeah, not bad at all. Uh, yeah, busy, busy week. Internationals coming up. The start of Russia 2018 campaign. You know, Juan Carlos Osorio's first first week in charge, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it in a bit. But you know, fascinating to to see how he goes this week, and and to see if he gets up on the right foot. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely fascinating stuff. And let's just get straight into it with Juan Carlos Osorio. I know we could, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. <laughs> and if any of you haven't seen the pre- like heard the press conference earlier today, it was some interesting things which we we're about to talk about. So for <laughs> me, I think the thing that the thing that stood out to me the most, I know some people talk about Gio, some people talk about you know the goalkeeper, blah, blah, blah the player rotation, but to me, like, uh, like as a fan, I think what stood out to me the most was him basically saying that he's going to put Layun at right back and that Layun and Paul Aguilar are going to be fighting for that same spot at right back. I'm going to go over to Tom on this. Tom, just tell me your thoughts. What, what was your initial reaction, actually, when you heard that he was going to be uh, trying to put Layun in that right back position? Somebody who's already interviewed Osorio, and I've tried to get an interview but failed so far with the Federation, but somebody who's interviewed him actually told me that that's what he's, you know, that's what he's thinking. And, and so it, it didn't come as a shock, but when you actually hear it from him, you're like, all right, that's, that's really interesting, you know. And, I mean, I suppose it made sense because you had Fuentes and Torres Nilo in the squad who were both left-backs. But, yeah, I mean, he said in the press conference at right-back, I think he can play further forward as well in a midfield role. Um, if there's three midfielders on on the right side of that, so yeah, it is different. I mean, arguably, he's you know one of Mexico's top. Would it be ridiculous to say three best players right now in terms of form? Yeah, maybe you know? five. Maybe five. he's yeah. he's up there. He's up there. Yeah, he's up there. I mean, it's an unbelievable form. He's on the for me the form of his life, and and to move him out from that position. I mean, I think this what this shows about Osorio is his kind of academic background. He's like, this is how I play. This is, you know, oh, he plays on the left. No, I, I don't play him there because if you're a midfield or back, so basically in defence, then you have to play on your right side, which is uh, which is interesting. I mean, yeah, I think it's uh, it's something that I think, and I'm sure we're going to get into it, and I'm sure Andrea will looking at her tweets earlier today, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something that's going to rub people up the wrong way in the uh, Mexican press. I, I feel like just, just following the, the Twitter account from ESPN FC earlier today, the ESPN FC Mexico account, I should say, I, I feel like there were many, many people who did not have nice things to say about Osorio after they heard that decision. But let's go over to Andrea. I mean, you've been following uh, America all season. You've been following Paul Aguilar. What does this mean for Paul Aguilar? Do you think Paul Aguilar could potentially, I don't know, beat Layun for this, uh, for this position at right back? Oh, it's definitely possible. Anyone who saw uh, Aguilar score in the CONCACAF Cup uh, knows that he's playing really well and he's he's capable of a lot. And um, Europe or no, you know, Layun's not going to take that uh, that form away from Aguilar. And I honestly think it's part of what Juan Carlos Osorio wants to do to make the players, all of them, a little bit uncomfortable that no player should feel like uh, he has a spot nailed down, that each player has to go out and prove themselves on the field, and that he's willing to kind of really take a fresh look at some of the things that uh, that maybe the Mexican team thought, you know, oh, this is kind of set in stone. 
Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, as far as the fan reaction goes, uh, fans are adaptable to what works. I mean, do you remember, I think, Caesar? it was even you who panicked a little bit when Thuka had his uh, uh, attacking lineup for CONCACAF Cup? And right. well, thinking, I, panic, I panic a lot, but, you know, but yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's why you're so representative of the fan voice sometimes, because... Um, you, you you do look at at you're willing to look at things not only objectively but a little bit emotionally. I can't help and, it. Yeah. Well. Yeah, okay. But I'm turning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's an attribute. Really embrace it. And I think you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um yeah, and it worked out. So everyone was you know everyone not only forgave Tuca but praised Tuca for it in the end because it works. If what Juan Carlos is doing works for Mexico then everyone will be like, genius, this is what we needed. Someone willing to really uh, experiment with tactics and you know, make the Mexican players uncomfortable and push them to the next level. Mm -hmm. However, if it doesn't work, and here's the three thing with Osorio, with his clubs, he has had more time. He can tweak not only in practice, but in different games, because you get games back-to-back -back in a season. You don't get that chance with uh, a national team which basically only has a few games a year, and they start qualifying like right now. So if this experiment doesn't work against El Salvador, and Osorio has said that that's the most important game, uh, I'm, I'm not just saying La Yun, but his other approaches, if it doesn't work right from the beginning, how much rope do you think Osorio is going to be given, especially since uh, Duca has done what he did. He went unbeaten in four games. He beat the United States, Mexico's biggest rival. He got Mexico that Confederations Cup spot. He made Mexico look pretty damn good against Argentina, who, you know, is kind of in some ways the emotional rival of what uh, uh, a lot of Mexican fans want their team to aspire to and compete with. So um, this is basically like waiting in the wings, looking over Osorio's shoulder. And Osorio, I have to say, is not doing himself any favors. In his press conference, did you see the way he was looking at his notes and just like completely cut off from the camera and not engaging with the people at all? I well, mean, there's yeah, a basic no, thing yeah. of like, if you want to, if you want people to think that you are honest and forthright, you look at them, you let them see your eyes. And he was—he's so academic and detached and kind of a little bit cold in the way he comes off. And which is not to say that Tuca was, you know, super cuddly. I mean, Herrera may be very, uh, Herrera may, may have been very charismatic, and Tuca less so, but Tuca had his own charm. I mean, look at how he shaved his mustache after he, after, you know, I mean, yeah, that's kind of a, a cool thing that he had a bet going with the players and stuff like that. Osorio is not going to be like that. And nobody cares as long as he wins. But if he doesn't win, he's got absolutely no goodwill with the Mexican public to let him fall back on. Uh, and you mentioned that. I mean, here's the thing: is like, like you said, you know, if he, if these experiments do work, like you said, he's going to be called a genius. But I mean, he's going to be playing at the Azteca, and we've we've seen fans at the Azteca. As soon as Mexico doesn't do well, even for about 60 to 70 minutes, the fans they turn against the team <laughs> immediately, start whistling, you know, against Mexico, start supporting, you know, the other team. So wh who knows how you know how much time like Osorio will begin? Who knows how much patience fans will really have? Uh, for exactly. a manager like uh, for us, sort of, but I mean, but, but, I mean, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how well. But, and, I, and I brought this up earlier. Yeah. Oh, go, go for it, Tom. Go for it. Tom. No, I just, I mean, I, I agree with Andrea. I think it's all about results. I mean, it obviously, will be about. I think, especially with Mexico. I, don't, I mean, it's going to sound like a. It, I mean, it might sound a bit like, you know, uh, harsh, harsh criticism. No, this is good. This, this, yeah, let's, let's, let's make it harsh. I'm, this is good. I'm not sure a lot of the press are educated enough. I'm not sure Mexico football in general is educated enough mm -hmm. to understand and kind of take in these what he's trying to say. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which I think makes it an even more kind of potent mix so, there. You know what I mean? Because well, if it doesn't work out, then then nobody's going to be like, you know, I've been doing a bit of research and kind of, you know, he studied football and science in John Moore's University in Liverpool, and there's a professor professor there, Tom Riley, and you know, I've read a bit of his things, and it's like it's highly academic. I mean, mm -hmm. it's brilliant stuff. But I mean, I just don't know how. And the classic was Thomas Boy. Mm -hmm. Thomas Boy, who the hell's this guy? <laughs> He's this Osorio <laughs> guy. I've never heard of him. And I think he, in a certain way, represents Mexican football's mentality. He's very close-minded. And I just wonder if 
it's going to be even more difficult for him because of that. But yeah. obviously, these are so, so, such early days, and and you know he needs to he needs to be given a chance. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to be kind of putting you on the spot here, but are there are there certain things that come to mind? Do you think it's hard for Mexico fans and the Mexican media, you know, to really take in, and uh, maybe Juan Carlos Osorio understands, but maybe certain fans, certain members of the media, do, they just can't really, yeah, like I said, just can't take it in. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, things like, you know, but 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 then again, it's not. It's it's a bit of both. I think there's a mm -hmm. bit of element of that, especially from the Mexican media, of simply not understanding not going outside that bubble and looking now how other games developed in certain other places, but it's also Osorio is extreme. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not many national teams in the world who are going to change um, change the starting lineup mm -hmm. in, in FIFA in FIFA dates. I mean, you know, in, are Argentina going to play one, what is it, they're playing Brazil and Colombia, no? Are they yeah. going to play like one team against Brazil and one against Colombia? I don't think so. And I think even in Argentina, they'd be, go crazy if they did. Now, I think Osorio is going to do that. And I mean, if the results don't come, then I think everybody's going to be like, why is Chicharito only playing one game? He's in <laughs> unbelievable form. Why is Layun only playing one game and, then, and in his wrong position? Like, I, I just think they're going to jump on it if the results don't come. Because he is, it is quite extreme. You know, it's, a very, it's an academic way of looking at the game. No, it's like I guess an example you could make. Yeah, go, for, go for Andrea. Yeah. I'm just thinking that academic or no, to me, uh, I don't know. Maybe I think of everything in terms of food, but you know, you can <laughs> you can say that you know, like. Uh, it's worse you're looking at things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Osorio is like you know kale or uh, grass-fed oh, organic oh, beef God. or something, Dude. and people are used to McDonald's and chicken nuggets. I don't know, um, but. Uh, the bottom line is, is like what fills you up or what's effective. I mean, I have nothing against Osorio's uh, background, and I read some of those things too, and I think that that's that's all well and good, and that's part of the reason why we're excited to have someone with such a scientific brain and approach to kind of like analyze and break down and rebuild L3 to something kind of new. But on the other hand, I've seen what Osorio does, and it only works if the players buy in. When he was here in MLS, it worked when we had core players, many of whom happened to be Colombian, and that really bought in to everything that he was doing. And when he didn't have that, his experimentation didn't work. Players got sick of it. They, yeah. they felt like they, he didn't trust them. They felt like uh, he was just kind of a mad scientist, and they felt kind of like... Uh, I mean, there's there's discomfort because you want competitiveness, and then there's discomfort because you don't know what the heck is going on in your coach's head, and he doesn't talk to you to explain it to you. He mm -hmm. writes down everything in those in that little notebook of his, and then he walks away. Yeah. And <laughs> it it started to fall apart for his teams in MLS when people started making jokes about the notebooks. Instead of you know trusting that it was like something important and meaningful and something that was going to make the team better, you either really believe in Osorio and you back him 100 percent. It doesn't matter if the media backs him as long as the players do, as long as the players buy into that. But if they don't, and as soon as the results start going south, everybody's going to be like, "Why are we eating this kale or this quinoa or this weird stuff we've never heard of? Give us some rice and beans, something that we can count on, something that we know is good," you know? Because because people are going to want to fall back with what they feel familiar with and what works. Yeah, and, and the other thing, what you said before, Andre, is that um, I think it's a key point in that I think Osorio, his biggest thing before taking this job was that he's not going to have much time to um, to work with the players because it's not like at a club side. And there's actually an interview on YouTube that can, people can watch. I can't remember who it's with, but it's a lengthy interview, like half an hour. And Osorio even said it, and this was a few years ago. And he said, you know, my only thing about managing a national team is not having the players. And I think when you've got such a strong philosophy like that, like it has, and the promises to be so exciting for Mexico, it's the, the, the downside of that is will they buy into it considering they're not going to have much time working with him? Um, it's, it's, I don't know. And I mean, the other thing that I mean, I think we can move on to briefly is uh, is the Giovanni Dos Santos. That's what I was going to bring up. I was going to... I mean, there's... there's <laughs> I mean, one of what one of the um, one of the headlines I think in Medio Tiempo was like strange reasoning or something. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was. I mean, he's already getting criticised because 
apparently Santiago Baños said last week that the reason Giovanni isn't being called up is that um, you know Juan Carlos Osorio hasn't had time to go and visit him in person, and that he he doesn't like to call up players that he doesn't know in person, which is like. A little bit weird, you know what I mean? Most yeah, it's really weird. weird because he was just in Tijuana last week. He could have popped up, you know, a three-hour drive to visit Johnny in LA. I mean, the, uh, I read that Medio Tiempo article too, and it was like kind of like weak excuse or bad logic, you know. Yeah, that was it, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, it, and it's true because it it sounds like so kind of shady. And that's what gives, you know, uh, credence to rumors that, oh, it's really a feud between Gio and Desio de Maria because uh, they're mad that Gio claimed injury but then played with the Galaxy. And, uh, you know, or, or they're mad because he supported, you know, Herrera in that tweet um, after the confr confrontation with Martinoli. But that argument doesn't make sense because Jonathan Dos Santos... I'll say, Jonathan's in the team. Jonathan's right there, yeah. <laughs> You know, but people are, are, are thinking of all these random things because Osorio's reason does not really make sense. So, I mean, well, according to Osorio, though, it says because, you know, because he asked, you know, Gio, like, what position he prefers, and then apparently he said, you know, that, you know, he, that position he prefers, you know, there are much better options in that position, and that Gio hasn't convinced him, apparently hasn't convinced him enough to be in the national team. But here's my question to you guys is, what does Gio need to do to to convince Juan Carlos Osorio that he's good enough? Because I know, I mean, us Mexico fans, like we, just because of the association with the U.S. men's national team, we love to criticize MLS. I used to love to criticize MLS. I know I'm biased now because I have a San Jose two San Jose earthquake scars. Like, <laughs> I'm biased, but no, we love we love to criticize it. We hate it. But the thing is, is what does Gio need to do in order to convince him? He scored, what was it? I wrote it. He had three goals and five assists in ten league games. And it's it's kind of crazy to think about that form. And when you look at Oribe Peralta, who's only scored one goal in the last, I think, about six or seven league games for America, you know. And I know he, I, mean, I know Oribe Peralta has done well for the national team, but what what does what does Gio need to do? And I'll go to you, Andrea. You know, you you've been following the Galaxy. What does Gio need to do to convince Osorio? It's it's a weak excuse on many levels because a Osorio. Uh, as I pointed out in my article, he spent a good part of his career in uh, MLS. You know, made a run with the New York Red Bulls to MLS Cup, and uh, well, you know, lost. But um, that was an important part of his career at one point. And uh, when it fizzled out, when he didn't have the same impact with the team uh, that he had at uh, at a certain point, he. Uh, he was he was let go by the team. I don't know if he has hard feelings over that. He went down to Colombia. He rebuilt his career there, and of course uh, he was with Sao Paulo in Brazil when um, he came to the agreement with Mexico. So he's gone on to do other things and be successful. I don't know if the whole MLS thing left a bad taste in his mouth. Um, but I also thought because when he was in the league, one of the things he was saying was that Colombia's national team should call up some players that were playing in Colombia, including like Juan Pablo Angel uh, mm -hmm. with the New York Red Bulls, and, and basically saying, you know, this is a good league. It just seems so hypocritical for him to be like, mm -hmm. oh, this is a good league while he's coaching, and then suddenly when he's national team coach, to, to have that as something against uh, uh, Dos Santos. Yeah. And and even if he did, it just seems kind of silly because uh, it's Dos Santos is obviously so quickly removed or, or or just recently moved from Europe. So I mean, you just moved from Europe, and you know that that kind of form can't carry over. And the position argument, it just sounds like what Klinsman said about you know Landon Donovan. Oh, you know we have other players a little bit ahead of him at the forward position. Completely ignoring the fact that Lennon could also play midfielder, you know, yeah. and so could Giovanni. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like uh, where he's playing like a little further back as well uh, with the Galaxy sometimes. Um, yeah. and I, mean, I, I, I think it's a mixture I mean, thing. It's like the whole. It, it can be. It can be things like him recuperating from the injury, Osorio wanting to give other players some time, wanting to evaluate the uh, Geo situation later. But I do think this is something that has added to the skepticism. Basically, you've got the Layoon thing, which kind of made everyone go, huh? 
And then Osorio's very weak reasons for, you know, not calling Gio and yeah. basically acting like, oh, well, he's going to have to convince me. And, like, Tom pointed out, as far as Gio's statistics, they're pretty dang solid. So if he said anything along the lines of, um, you know, these are the players I'm looking at right now, Gio's in consideration, I'm going to look at him a little bit later. It would have made more sense to people than right. like, oh, he's going to have to convince me, especially since MLS is in the off season. It's not like you know those Santos can magically like do something right this second. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's actually Tom. You're 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 about to say something. No, I, I mean I think I can make an argument that you know Gio hasn't done enough to be there. I mean I think his recent games for Galaxy haven't been the best. I mean I know he's coming off that injury. I don't what the the argument I don't understand is the injury one because he's played three full games. Since yeah. that injury, and so I, you know, I don't understand, you know, Osorio saying he's not quite there. I mean, the other thing, he won't have played for a couple of weeks by the time the El Salvador game comes because Galaxy dropped out of the MLS playoffs. So I mean, that's one reason. But I think the the, the position reason is valid as well. And I think, um, you know, I think if he, if he wants to play with El Salvador, I think Osorio pretty much stated that he wants to play with two number nines, and Gio wants to play behind there. I mean. I don't know. I don't. I don't think that position exists in in Osorio's what will likely be what a four four two against El Salvador, mm -hmm. and then a four three three against um, Honduras. Um, now, obviously, he can play out wide, Giovanni, but I don't know. And, and I think there's a question mark about his personality now as well. I really do. I think that the fact that Osorio's not been there to see him. I mean, it might be it might be legitimate. He, he might want to actually chat to Giovanni and see you know where his head's at. I mean, he's just move from a, a team that was challenging for Champions League places in La Liga to, to MLS. I mean, it is a substantial drop in, in quality as well. So I just, I just think there's a few question marks there with Giovanni. And if you add them up, you know, I'm not saying it's the right decision, but you, I, you can justify what Osorio's done with him. I mean, it's just, I can understand that, but like say, you know, you have, it, it seems like he, yeah, Osorio has a lot of compliments about Jimenez and, and Chicharito right now. And I wouldn't surprise me if those were his two favorite options. Say Chicharito and Jimenez, are, they're starting, they're struggling to score. You look in your bench, and who would you rather have there? Would you rather have Oribe Peralta, or would you rather have Giovanni Dos Santos come in? No, I know, I know, what, you're saying, and I know what you're saying there, but I think look at Oribe against the United States. And I think mm -hmm. Giovanni, if, you, if there is a bit of a question mark over his career, he's quite fickle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It can be absolutely amazing like in the Gold Cup final, but if you want to play, you're going to absolutely rely on, is that Gio? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like his career, I know he's been hampered by injury, but the big criticism of Giovanni Dos Santos' career is he's, he's not lived up to the expectation because of his lack of inconsistency. His lack of consistency, sorry. He's mm -hmm. had those magic, unbelievable moments, but they've been few and far between. But again, I think what people are looking at as a question is like, not that you start Gio, not even that you necessarily have him as like a first option off the bench, but not to even bring him into camp, but not to even bring him in for a look. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, um, it, and, and you're right, in that sense, people have always looked at uh, Giovanni as like, when is he going to fulfill his potential? And if Osorio isn't even bringing him into camp, suddenly that becomes something that's not even an option, and it's something that people have always been hoping for. And it raises a question mark not only about Gio, but also about Osorio. Is Osorio the man to best manage our top Mexican talent if he starts off by casting them aside without even giving them a look and a chance? Mm. Now, now, here's a question for both of you guys really quickly. Is that, okay, so, he has, so, so Osorio has made his excuses, essentially, for not calling up Gio. Do you think there's a possibility he's going to call up Gio maybe for the next World Cup qualifying uh, batch of games early next next year. Say Gio continues, um, I guess the MLS season doesn't really start until March. So I guess yeah. it'll, be, it'll be a little tough for Gio to really prove him right. Unless but he goes on loan, um, but, uh, but then he doesn't really get an off-season, you know, That's and then... True. So I guess I, I actually didn't even really think about that until now because I thought like, what if he could prove him right, or prove himself that he is like a, or prove himself wrong that like a, you know he is an excellent player, or whatnot. But you know there is no opportunity until the season starts in March. So I mean, just keeping that in mind, do you think there's a chance that Juan Carlos Osorio will call him up in the next batch of uh, of the roster call-ups? Um, Tom, do you think there's any a possibility? Yeah, no, I think he's very much in the frame. I think I just think that at this moment there's a, a few things that have kind of 
um, come together and then, all right, that he's decided against it, you know what I mean? But I think if everything's normal and Giovanni's coming off the back of a few weeks without injury and that, you know, they've had a chance to talk because cause I think Giovanni can play on the wing in a 4-3-3 as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I think arguably that's his best position, like the playing right wing and cutting inside. Um, but maybe, you know, so yeah, I definitely think the door's still open for him. Um, he, he just has to really, really shine in MLS like somebody like, you know, Fabian Castillo has. Who, who, you know, now in the Colombia squad, who, which is unbelievable. So he has to, but he has to be matching at MLS's best at a minimum. Or What's Jesse kind of Gonzalez, right? No, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that later. <laughs> What's yeah, kind of sad is that uh, is that we're still waiting not only for Gio's potential, but the potential of uh, Gio Bella uh, connection, you know, on the field, and not to mention uh, a Gio Jana. Uh, as, as far as his brother Jonathan, I mean, to to really be playing together. I mean, these two grew up together, and he's been playing with Carlos Vela since he was 16. Uh, as far as really making the most of that connection and that understanding on the field, um, I don't know. I personally feel cheated that you know Osorio took that from me. That I don't get to see it possibly working, even if it's just on the practice field. You know, watching them like you know make little combinations and stuff together. Um, and if what Tom is saying is true, and Gio has to prove himself in MLS play, then it's what you said, Caesar. We have to wait until at least March, and yeah. probably given a couple of months for him to prove himself in games, um, even after that. So not a bad little holiday, is it for him? Really? I mean, what? It's early November now. He's already had like two weeks off. <laughs> oh, he's gonna have a, he's gonna have a great time. It's gonna be nice <laughs> weather in LA. It's gonna be hanging it. out. Going to some Laker games. I hope he invites me. I don't know. So, so, so much money as well. I mean, it's not like you're short of a couple of dollars, is it? <laughs> oh, no. No, no. He'll be, he'll be all right. I have a feeling he's not going to be too bummed out uh, during this offseason. Uh, all right. All right so, so looking at other options, um, you know, as opposed to looking at the offense right now, let's look at our goalkeepers right now. Let's look at Mexico's goalkeepers. Right now we have Talavera, we have Ochoa, and Moises Munoz. So I'm going to ask each of you, and I've done this before in the other in the previous podcast. I'm going to ask each of you, who do you think should start, and who do you think will start? So I'm going to go to you, Tom. Tom, who do you think should start between Talavera Ocho Munoz, and who do you think will start? I think Talavera. I just I'm just a fan of Talavera. Um, I think he's the best goalkeeper in the league by salute by quite a way, and um, I think that. The only negative about Talavera is that when he's played for Mexico before, he doesn't always film with confidence. He's, he looks a bit nervous. Now, I know he played well the other month in uh, Toluca, but that was in his home stadium with his home yeah. fans. And it just makes me a bit nervous, but I think he's the best goalkeeper right now, Talavera. I mm -hmm. think that Osorio's made a wise decision with Ochoa. Um, he's been praising him since the day he walked into the job. And I think, Osorio, what he's doing there is... He's saying to Ochoa, look, I really like you. I want you to be my goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling you up. I'm not sure he's going to start these games because I think Osorio, you look at how he looks at the science behind the games and mm -hmm. I think he'll realise that Ochoa's not started a game since July and that's not good preparation to go into a, two big qualifying games. But I think he's got, he's got Ochoa there and if he makes his move in January, he starts to get minutes then, you know, Ochoa's going to absolutely love Osorio as well because he's going to be saying that, you know, he's building up that relationship already. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's Talavera for now and then I think moving forward, Ochoa. Moving forward, Ochoa. Okay, Andrea, your thoughts on the goalkeepers? Um, if I know Osorio, <laughs> and I don't really, <laughs> but, you know, from what I've seen, I think he has his own goalkeeper test all figured out and he's going to put all three of them through it and whoever scores the highest on it, uh, is going to be the one that he goes with, regardless of actual game time. And that's because, yeah, it may be the standard thing for you know a goalkeeper to um, be in game form, but Osorio, he trusts his uh, little um, matrix elements of like, you know, if, if he does like these various tests and Ochoa scores the highest, Ochoa is going to start. I mean, Ochoa is the uh, winning Gold Cup um, goalkeeper from the summer, and that w that came after a long period of not, you know, playing regularly for his club. Uh, with the reflexes that you need for um, goalkeeping, it's 
it's not just the game. And honestly, I think that what affects Talavera um, is what Tom pointed out, that he's not really comfortable with the national mm -hmm. team. He gets nervous. And um, he he feels the pressure of the unfamiliarity with, with the defenders in front of him, that he doesn't know exactly what they're going to do like he does with his club. And his communication isn't as good. And he honestly, I also think he tries too hard. He just comes out sometimes at the wrong time, like mm -hmm. trying to do too much in games. And it makes me nervous. And uh, I think I think that was great. But when he plays for the national team, I'm like, eh. And yeah, Ochoa may be rusty, but I haven't seen it yet in the games from Mexico. I haven't seen something that I'm like, oh, he really should have made that save, and he obviously didn't make it because he was rusty. Yeah. And oh, that's I think... I think if uh, Osorio feels that Ochoa is ready to go, he's going to get that start. And it may surprise a lot of people who expect to see. And it also, honestly, it may make Osorio look a little hypocritical if he's saying to Giovanni, you have to convince me. But then, you know, Ochoa gets a start when he's not even playing. Yeah, so, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking as well, that, you know, yeah, when you have... Yeah, you know, think, who's been sitting on the bench for so long. I that it happens, because he's been talking so much about Ochoa, and um, and I know that he he basically looks at certain things in practice as, as what's going to convince him. And I've seen it happen in club teams where normally you have coaches that, like, if the team just won a game, then in the next game they're going to put up pretty much the same lineup as long as, you know, there's no injuries or, you know, whatnot. Sodio's not like that at all. <laughs> he would put out yeah. lineups that we were just like, what? Whoa, what happened during the week? <laughs> you know, why is this? We heard nothing about this player, you know? And what happened was that he had seen something during the week that convinced him that that player should get this opportunity and he was going to do it. Yeah. No, so it sounds he didn't like care what conventional wisdom was. So it sounds like we're going to continue to have surprises with uh, Osorio. And I'm going to go to for you on this, Tom. Um, Going back to the press conference, um, anything from the press conference other than the whole Ayun thing, other than the Geo thing, um, what, what, anything that stood out to you that maybe once again like surprised us uh, from from the press conference earlier today? Um, I think the yeah, there's a few things. I think that he's looked at players like Eric Gutierrez, Rodolfo Pizarro, and uh, Irving Lozano at Pachuca, and he said, you know, I was considering them, but I don't think they're ready quite yet. Which I think is fair enough, to be honest. Yeah. I think uh, I think there's still I think the potential national team players, no doubt. But th that was interesting, and it was happy to hear him kind of talk about those younger players because I think they, they have got a big future. Um, yeah, I think that the fact he spoke to the likes of Cuauhtémoc Blanco, um, Luis Garcia. Oh, he was name dropping. Um, I, I can yeah. I can hear him doing those name drops, and all the fans are like, oh, you know your stuff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it's something that. You know, perhaps other coaches have lacked that kind of. And he and he asked them like, what what's the problem when we go and we play Central American teams? And they all said, you know, we're expected and we think we have to go and you know thrash them, go yeah. And it's like we don't. We just have to go and win, and we have to lower that expectation and get these grind out results. So, you know, it's interesting to hear that. And I think I think he's completely right there. Um, and then what else? Yeah, I mean the the, the changes. I mean, I think he made it very, very clear, and he, he spoke at length about you know Rafa Marquez playing too much, and and the injury being the result of that, mm -hmm. and that was really interesting. He said, you know, basically a lot of these players like Chicharito, if they play these two games, they'll have played four four games in 15 days for for club and country, and he's saying that's just completely too much. And you know, he was like, oh yeah, speaking to Rafa Marquez over there, and I asked Rafa, hey, he's four, you know, it's four games in 15 days, too much. And Rafa said, "Yeah, it was." So it was like it was quite weird when he was speaking like that. But um, but yeah, I think he's that. I think that means. I, th I think I think we're going to see two almost completely different teams. Yeah. I think we're going to see two different formations. And um, and yeah, it goes back to the very start of this conversation. If if the results go well, then everybody's going to be you know patting him on the back and loving it. If things go wrong, then you know Honduras away. With Pinto in charge, yeah, five what, eight two or something formation. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's difficult to break down, and then they get the set pieces, and you know they're well drilled under somebody like Pinto. So, but that's where it's really going to perhaps look odd to not even have Dos Santos as an option. You know, if you're you're really running out two squads, 
and you're giving some of your top offensive players uh, a rest. Um, yeah, anyway. But once oh, again, right. kind this, of going, this is, you said name dropping. Do you see, do you see Tom, um, just in the way he's interacted with the team so far, do you see Osorio being um, inspirational for... Um, or L3, because, because here's the thing, when he was in MLS, the players who bought into his plan once again, and I sound like a broken record on it, but it's true, <laughs> were the Colombian players, yeah. you know, the, the ones well, that he was particularly close to, and, and as long as uh, the plan was working, other players bought into it too. As soon as the going got tough, I mean, basically, that's where, you know, and, and if you look at... Osorio's track record. Where has he had the most success? Yeah, I don't know in Colombia, but I think I think. Yeah, uh, but think you know, and 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 to find that connection with you know a national team when um, the players are not only a different nationality, but you get them in so rarely, and um, and you're not the sort of like rah rah emotional type like either Herrera or even passionate like Duca in a different way. Um, what exactly is going to be that thing? Are, are players going to get all jazzed about you being like, you know, this uh, kind of, you know, professor, Doc Brown type uh, <laughs> who likes yeah. to, like, try different things? Um, well, well I, think, I think, firstly, let's go back to when he got, when he was named. I mean, I, I know every player came out and said, you know, oh, great, you know, blah, 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 we're going to give it all. But I, I heard a little rumor that some of them weren't too happy. I mean, and you can see why they wouldn't be because of his, you know, what he's achieved in the game arguably isn't enough to get the Mexico job. I mean, I completely see that. But to come up with what you're saying, I think what you could argue is that for a national team, the players that are there, and I think it's, you know, I, th I think they want to succeed. They can't go, there's no out. They either play for the national team and get to a World Cup or they don't. And I think the vast majority of players really, really want to play in World Cups, they want to be at World Cups. And I agree with what you're saying in terms of, you know, the Mexico players also have a lot of say, they have a lot of power. And if, if they aren't with the manager, and there is that risk with Osorio that they do go against him if things don't go well. But I'd say at, at the start, I think they're all going to be like really, really trying to... Be, because at the end of the day, they want to succeed with this national team. At the same yeah. time, you, you, can, you can understand how some of them would be a, a little let down. I mean, let's let's... Let's be honest. When we heard Osorio's name, there very, very few people were excited. Very few people were just like, you know, up in arms, like, yeah, cause, yeah, this is the man we wanted. Because we there was a rumor for Bielsa for so long. Then there's a Sampoli, and then Duca came in, and he did such a good job. And then, and then as as an I mean, as like intelligent and as academic as Osorio is, and I remember seeing this article recently it's saying that like Osorio is one of the top fifty managers in the world. You know, which I think they ranked him actually like number forty-nine or fifty. So it wasn't like he was at the, he was like he was a number he was like he was number two or three. But as exciting as that is, you look at his resume, and it's nothing that really excites you as a Mexican. It's nothing that really makes you feel empowered and excited. Just like oh, this is excellent. This is the guy in charge. So I could see how a lot of these players who you know a lot of these players who play in Europe. Who well, may not who, who may not be you know just thrilled to have this? They 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 love Bielsa. I mean, why why wouldn't they? You know, they, they, like I said, they want to succeed. They want to do well. I mean, because someone like Chicharito, who's had Angelotti, he's, he's had Ferguson. Yeah. You know, he had Van Gaal for a little bit. I mean, I know it didn't end up well, but those are top 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 managers. And now he's you know coming back and he's working with with a you know a, a manager whose biggest achievements are in the Colombian league. I, mean, uh, I think that. Chicharito has said some of the most positive comments about Osorio, and right now that's key because Chicharito is so hot right now that anything that he endorses, you know, is kind of like sprinkling his protective fairy dust on right now yeah. because. Um, but, but Chicharito's a robot. I don't know. I, I'm still yeah, I'm still no, convinced he's, he's not a real human being. He's just he's, he's like. Gonna, a, he's always gonna say positive things. He's always gonna be like Mr. Sunshine and look on the positive yeah, side. Yeah. And honestly. Uh, I think when his career is done, people are going to look back and, and say, you know what, that that his amazing persistence, but um, 
But while he's still playing and he doesn't have like the the drama or the enigma of like a Guatemoc Blanco or something, people are gonna be like, oh, Chicharito, always positive, always trying, you know. Um, but not only because he's having success in Germany, but because right now he is on pace to be Mexico's greatest striker, just in terms of goals. Greatest striker. You know? you're, you're saying he's gonna be better than Hugo Sanchez. You, you, would you would you say that right now? For the national team, he already is. Oh, not for the national. I just meant in general, just like in talent. For the national team, he already is. <laughs> From a national team standpoint, if you're looking at who has contributed the most, and you can, you know, I mean, that just sounds so good. Hugo Sanchez and Penta Pichi for Real Madrid, uh, and and definitely more illustrious than Chicharito's stint in Real Madrid. But for the national team, you can't take away all the goals that Chicharito has scored. They stand there. And he's probably going to end up number one, and they will stand there for some time. And um, that being said, I mean, to get Chicharito on side with his plan to talk to him one-on-one -on -one and have Chicharito say the positive things about how analytical and humble and uh, uh, Osorio is, is an important part of the PR engagement. And Osorio may not even realize that there is an important PR element to his... Um, to, to his coaching. I'm not saying he should be at all like Herrera and start making commercials and tweeting things for various political parties, but yeah, he needs to make sure that he uh, sells himself as the right coach for the team, um, even though he has the job, because Mexico doesn't mess around with uh, you know allowing coaches to stay on. He's not going to have that much time if he doesn't find a way to convince everybody. Wins are the easiest way, but yeah, they're, you know, part of it is selling the message, selling the plan, letting everyone know, yes, I'm different, I'm going to do things differently, because what Mexico needs is something different. Yeah. What's no, I, worked is kind I, I, of I, 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 a certain level of par. Yeah. Everyone talks about that quinto partido, like it's, you know, the Great Wall of China, or something like, whoa, where are we ever going to get past this? You know, um, and and a specific plan for it, an analysis, a breakdown for you know what what Osorio has is like this game plan that's like this huge campaign, like people who have planned out I don't know the attack on Normandy, not only for qualifying but for how Mexico is going to change and go forward into the World Cup, and that's part of the whole interview that sold um, the. Um, the Mexico administrators on this is the guy because yeah. he actually has a plan. He's not just saying, you know, oh yeah, I'm a good coach. I'm gonna come in and do a good job. He says, this is how Mexico yeah. can get, and I have all these ideas and all these plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan Z. Hmm. But, no, and I, I, I think, but he, he, you know, one of those first plans is gonna have to work, or he's not gonna be able to get to plan D. And all, you know, all I'm saying is, if, if plan B doesn't work, I don't think fans or the FMF will have very much patience for him. May, I, I think we do need changes in FMF, but who knows if he's the right guy for that change? But I know, I've, I've been wrong so many times in the past, but but we shall see. But anyway, we've been talking about a story. We've been talking about the national team for for 45 minutes, actually 46 <laughs> minutes. Uh, but really quickly, before before we leave the national team. Uh, I want to hear really quickly your, your guys' uh, predictions for this Friday. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, it doesn't even have to be a prediction for a scoreline. Maybe a prediction of something else Soldier is going to do that's going to catch us off guard. Maybe something that's going to happen on the field. Just, just a prediction general for Mexico, uh, El Salvador, uh, this Friday. I'm going to go with Tom. It could be a scoreline, it could be a Soldier thing. Just a prediction for Friday. No, I think it's going to be like you know 2 3 nil. I just I think Mexico much better than El Salvador player for player. Um, El Salvador's think, backup players. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that the players know each other, and I think, you know, obviously Osorio's only had a few days anyway, so how much is he actually going to change, mm -hmm. you know? But then I think the second game in Honduras is the is the really big one. That's definitely the big one. So that'll be, that'll be, that'll be a good podcast next Monday, uh, heading into that match. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Andrea, your thoughts really quickly. Predictions just uh, about uh, Friday's game. Yeah, Mexico should win, but I think that Mexico tends to... Uh, drop focus a little bit. I, I think it's not going to be as impressive a win as people want. I would say it's actually going to be a 1-0 win. Yeah. Mexico's uh, going to hit the El Salvador bunker and be kind of stymied for a while. And it's not going to be the um, 
the blowout that many expect on these little Central American teams once yeah. again. Yeah, I mean, I, I would typically agree with you, but this is also an El Salvador team where there are a lot of problems internally with the squad. And you look at the yeah. call-up list, you see that 16 of the players are 25 or younger. You see that 17 of the players have 10 caps or less. And it's 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 going to be it, this isn't even El Salvador El Salvador at their best. Yes, maybe Mexico would stumble, maybe they would have problems. But this is an El Salvador team that hasn't really spent that much time together. It's an El Salvador team. I think only six players in the last call up are being incorporated to this side. So we shall see. We shall see. So all right. So really quickly with uh, about let's see, twelve minutes left. Let's talk about Chicharito. Seems to be doing all right. You know. I think he's been getting a little bit of attention with his what is eight <laughs> goals in his last six games. Tom, you've been a, uh, you, I mean, you you interviewed Chicharito. What was it? Uh, I mean, before he even left, uh, before he even left Mexico. Well, Tom, what are your thoughts? Is this seeing seeing him play all the way back from Chivas, all the way to over here right now in Europe and with Real Madrid and Manchester United? Is this going to be Chicharito's best season ever? Best season? I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it depends if you go off personal achievement and then trophies won because you know obviously yeah. that first one when they won the Premier League as well was absolutely huge. But yeah, yeah, it's a massive season for him, and I mean, I just think you know, give Chicharito minutes, put him in a team that plays in a certain way and and crosses and gets used to him, and he'll score your goals. I mean, he'll also miss a few, but you know, that's what strikers do, you know. Um, and he's the top player. I mean. That, that's that's all really I think there is to say. He's a top player. Not not at all surprised. You know, he might have a bad patch in another month, and everyone will be like, "Oh, he's lost it," and then he'll come back. I mean, it's just the way it is. The way the media is, and and he's playing really well. And I think is the style of Bayer Leverkusen is really suited to him. I think it's quite fast the way they play. Is you know they they move the ball up the field quite vertically and and, and rapidly, and I think that that gives him time time to make his his runs. And I think as the, the Leverkusen players are getting used to his movement and it's not easy because, you know, I think he requires, he needs to play with top players who can who can read his movement to, to be able to, and to be able to put the passes to him. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, it's not a surprise. I mean, he's in his prime as well. So, you know, really happy for him as well. I just think he's uh, obviously a really top, top example for, for Mexican football and, and Mexico as a country as well. So, you know, it's great to see him uh, back on that pedestal as, uh, you know, the, 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 the goal-scoring hero. Oh, yeah, no, I, I agree. He's, he's a well-spoken, intelligent guy. He's always positive. Like I said, he's a robot. He's one of my favorite robots of the <laughs> soccer world. Robot. One of my favorite robots of the soccer world. <laughs> rarely shows emotions. But he's, you know, he's consistent, good. But Andrea, you're saying? <laughs> Rarely shows emotion. He cries. You know, <laughs> that was like what? When was the last time you saw Chicharito cry? I have to disagree with Tom uh, in terms of I don't believe Chicharito is a top player. I believe he's a high-level player. And part of the reason why he uh, is successful with Bayer Leverkusen is he found his level. To me, it's similar to what happened to Carlos Vela when Carlos Vela's career stalled at Arsenal. Um, because Chicharito is not the top top level uh, that you know is going to get the regular start at Real Madrid or at Manchester United. He was kind of stuck in just you know, but but he's really found his niche in a level just below that, which is still very high, which is still Europe. So that's still also you you're doing well in Bayer Leverkusen. That's a high in the, level in the Champions League. That's, that's yeah, that, that's a Champions League. That's not the top level. Okay, so this is, this is semantics right here. <laughs> it, it's not semantics in the sense that the same thing, you know, uh, with you know Carlos Vela, Real Sociedad has been a Champions League team, but they're not there on the regular like you know Real Madrid and Manchester United are. So all I'm saying is for players to succeed, obviously they need playing time. And sometimes they're just at that high level right behind the very top level. And mm -hmm. that's what Chicharito has found. And that's the niche that's successful for him. A coach that believes in him, a team that needs him. So that's the other thing. Real Madrid, Manchester United, they didn't really need Chicharito. That's why he was on the bench and only sometimes used. Because they had other options that were that little bit ahead that mm -hmm. they found to be more reliable. And so all, all I'm saying is as much as he's a great example for go over to Europe and find success, you know, success means being able to get that playing time. And sometimes that means a slightly smaller team in Germany, Spain, or in the case of Guardado, mm -hmm. the Netherlands. 
I think there's a there's a big difference between what Guardado is doing and what Chicharito is doing. And I mean, you've seen the stat. I mean, it's not like he's it's just. I'm just saying, just find your goals. level. Find your I mean, level. He's he's, he's scoring he's scoring in the Champions that's League. That's that's the highest level, isn't it? What did you say? The Champions League in club soccer is the highest level. Is is the highest level actually getting to the Champions League or competing for the trophy? I would say for I would say if we're talking about club teams, I think Champions League is the highest level. I think competing competing for the trophy, yes, but I think taking part on, in those Champions League games is the highest level you could truly compete in, though. Okay, now you're getting into semantics. I mean, the highest level <laughs> isn't just reaching the Champions League; it's yeah. actually being one of the viable contenders for the trophy. Okay. That's the highest level, okay. and then right below that is just making it to the competition. But there is a difference. Well, we we'll shall see, because right now, um, we'll, we'll see if, if Fire Love Recusa can even make it to the next round. I mean, right now, here's, here's the thing. We, if we're going to talk about Chicho and how well he's been doing, one thing we also have to recognize is that Fire Love Recusa themselves have been kind of underwhelming, and we've all seen how awful that defense is as well. And so, so who knows if Chicho Rito can even carry Bayer Leverkusen. That being said, I still think he's a top player. You're, you're playing in Bundesliga, you're scoring in Champions League. <laughs> that's that's a top player to me. That's a top player. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Um, so let's talk about really quickly about Miguel Layun. Uh, I mean, you know, Chicho Rito has been doing extremely well, but Layun has also been out there. He's been, he's had a, I wrote this, I think it was a, I think it was a goal, yeah, goal and two assists last week for Porto. And I'm gonna go. <laughs> that was a cool yeah. that I, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go over to you uh, on a day on this, but uh, you know, is right now? Do you think he's is he potentially going to have a better season than Pecatito and Hector Herrera for Porto? Miguel Layun, who uh, you know, think there's a lot of talk about Pecatito, but it looks like Layun might be doing a better job than he is. I'm letting Tom answer that. <laughs> Tom. Um, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I think he's hit the hit the ground running. I mean, it's it's brilliant to see. I mean, you know, we didn't know how we how we'd adapt to it. I think he was uh, there was some question marks about the move, and it's absolutely worked out. And he's shown himself to be a top player. Um, I think I think Tecatito. I think I said right at the start. I mean, give it. He needs time. You know, it's a new league. Is it's still a very young player. He's shown mm -hmm. he's shown a lot already. But you know, in terms of getting that absolute regular start, I think Porto have a lot of decent players on the wings as well. So you know, he's gonna, he's not gonna be playing every single minute. That's fine. The worrying ones are Herrera. I mean, he needs to be playing. He's in his prime now, and and it's slightly worrying that he's kind of dropped off and and he's no longer starting games because for me, he's still an absolutely key player for Mexico. Yeah, the, 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 the strange about Herrera though is like, I feel like we've all been kind of patient with Herrera. You know, where we're like, oh, he's had a little bit of a slump. Let's see when he picks it back up, but it's been months. It's yeah. been generally months. It's 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 not like it's been it's not like it's just been even just one or two months. It's been since the beginning of the Gold Cup. Since the beginning yeah. of the Gold Cup, he's just been he hasn't he hasn't looked good for the national team or for for Porto. And it's generally it, and generally it bums me out a lot, you know, because he's gotten the breaks as well. It's not like he's starting every game for Porto either. So it's it's hopefully. He'll, something will click. Maybe he'll get. Maybe he needs a couple of goals. Maybe or something just to pick him up. But it, it's really, uh, it's really unfortunate to see uh, Herrera struggling in a, in Porto right now. Yeah, uh, he now needs to be playing. I mean, the, the argument yeah. wasn't playing too much. Now he needs to be playing. I think he's a yeah. player as well. I, I actually sat sat next to him on a plane once, yeah. <laughs> and it was you know we had a good little chat. And one of the things he said, he just he just loves playing. I mean, he's just yeah. like, you know, he's <laughs> just one of them guys that you just like. You can just tell just. Absolutely loves being out on the field. It's what make it makes him tick as a person. And you can imagine if he's been a sub, he he just won't be happy. Yeah, yeah. But what one guy who has been playing, who's been doing well, and this could be really quickly touching on MLS is uh, and we'll go over to you, Andrea. Jesse Gonzalez. Yeah, over yes. in FC Dallas. Tell 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 us about that. Did, I hope I hope you got a chance to watch the game. I'm sure. You, did Did you watch the penalty kicks last night? Yes, All I right, did. Tell us I about did. it. Uh, well, I mean, after uh, the Walker Zimmerman uh, injury time goal to tie it all up on aggregate and then the scoreless extra time period, it went to penalty kicks. And you have Dallas, FC Dallas's 20 year old goalkeeper, who was formerly Mexico's, um, and does not say he's been replaced, but he's aged out of the under 20 team. Um, but he's still only 20 years old. 
And so he was in goal against, obviously, one of the top uh, goalkeepers in MLS, uh, Stephen Frey, for uh, the Seattle Sounders. And it was the PK shootout. And Jesse Gonzalez stopped. I'm not saying caused a miss. He stopped and blocked and parried two uh, penalty kicks that were on target until his intervention. And we all know that to a certain extent it's luck, you know, in that split second of guessing that the right way. But you got to admire the guts and gumption of a young goalkeeper to just, you know, trust his gut and instinct and to just go for it and basically set it up to um, uh, give FC Dallas a cushion so that Walker Zimmerman could step up, you know, knowing that his penalty kick make would win the match and advance Dallas. And that's what happened. Yeah, so, yeah, um, I, yeah the... I mean, I think, I think it's really kind of um, interesting how MLS homegrown talent, like someone who has come up from the academies, is producing really well for Mexico. And not mm -hmm. only on the under-20 level with Jesse Gonzalez, but also uh, with the LA Galaxy, their academy goalkeeper, Abraham, is, yeah, um, yeah is just was part of the semifinal run of mm -hmm. uh, Mexico to the uh, Under-17 World Cup mm -hmm. where they came pretty darn close to replicating the heroics of previous um, Under-17 teams from Mexico who have won the uh, title twice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, MLS Cup, uh, I know the Liguilla is about to start, but some of these games aren't bad, and there's a rooting interest now for people who uh, kind of may want to see the future of Mexico goalkeeping. If Jesse Gonzalez keeps it up, I don't see any reason why he shouldn't be considered by Osorio or whoever happens to coach Mexico at that point. <laughs> Tom, I think, I think there's only like one under 25 goalkeeper apart from him, Mexican, who's starting anywhere in the world, and that's uh, Doño Rodriguez over at Chivas, so yeah, big for him. I spoke to him last week, uh, he preferred speaking in Spanish to English, which is quite mad. I mean, maybe, maybe it was my accent, but, but we spoke in, in Spanish, I mean, he's very Mexican, I think, uh, parents from Toluca and Nayarit, so, you know, big Mexico fan said his dream is to wear the number one shirt for Mexico, he was very adamant, I didn't kind of try to get that out of him, that's how he said. Um, fascinating, fascinating story, he's been given the, the start after Dan Kennedy, who's one of these the league's like big names in terms of goalkeeping. He's been a stalwart for so many years, and he's given the chance, and he's just taken it. And I mean, that's what you want to see your young players do. So yeah, it's a, it's a great story, and um, who knows? I mean, we might be talking about a twenty-year-old Mexican goalkeeper lifting the MLS Cup in a couple of weeks. Yeah, which would which would be very very cool to see. The only real input I have to this is that I watched a game last night. It was fun. Uh, and that I, I saw I saw I saw somebody say bring that guy to Los Angeles and he favored it and I was like oh interesting all right that, that, that's, that's, the, the, the other that's, thing, that's all I have to say Jesse Ron, uh, Gonzalez sorry is watch out how much does he make in in, uh, in MLS because yeah. I guarantee you there will be Mexican teams now offer, you know looking at him and thinking this kid's already doing that over there in a f more physical league in some in some ways it's more difficult to be a goalkeeper in MLS. Yeah. And then we can, off I don't know, it's just going to be interesting to see if his agent can maneuver something in terms of a better contract with MLS yeah. or potentially move down to Mexico because, like I said, this is a big Mexico guy. I mean, he's brought up in Texas, but he prefers to speak to an English guy in Spanish. I mean, it's... Uh, That's fascinating. I had no clue. I thought, I assumed the whole thing was going to be, that the whole interview you had with him was in English. I had no idea that it was entirely I mean, Spanish. I thought it would be because he, <laughs> he was born in North Carolina. That's what I thought, Texas. too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so to, I mean, we we're over an hour now. We still have a few more things that I wanted to talk about, but it's okay. We'll we'll cut it we'll cut it a little bit early. I mean, I we want to talk about Osorio and whatnot, Can but I just re read them out. Okay, so really yeah, quickly, all right, we'll Pumas, Pumas to the super leader. Did we see this coming? Uh, yes or no, Pumas super leader. Andrea, no. yes or no? Didn't see it coming. I called for them to make the playoffs, but super leader, no. I I actually picked Club America, but they've been you know sputtering. Tom, did you see them becoming the super leader? No. Yeah, no, 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 no,
on the classical tapatio on Wednesday. Two sentences. <laughs> That's one sentence. Fine, I'll give us a second. Might as well have done five because I've taken up enough time. But I'm not. I'm just really disappointed with uh, both teams are out. I think Chivas. You know, there's been this big buzz about the Copper MX win and everything. It's like, uh -huh. you know, at the end of the day, in and Almeida especially, it's, it's like a rock star now in Guadalajara. At the end of yeah. the day, they've, they've not won in four league games. And yeah. in personal level, I'm absolutely gutted because a couple of weeks ago, both teams had a chance of making the league year, and mm -hmm. now all yeah. of a sudden, this this Clásico Tapatío is like pretty meaningless and I mean you know yeah. it's supposed to be the big game of the season for, for those of us who live in Guadalajara and it's like now it's like well you know yeah a few relegation points at stake <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's during an international break and it's on a Wednesday it's, 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 it's definitely become entirely deflated so it's, it's, it's unfortunate <laughs> it's really unfortunate it, it's, and it sucks because it was after after the big win for the Copa Mekis it seemed like there was going to be maybe this momentum leading into this game, but no, then they lost against the eh, it's not. It's not a good time. All right, uh, so let's see. Really quickly, Tom, why do we bring up Gignac? Got called up to the French national team, which is good for Liga Mekis, because when Gignac came over, people were thinking, well, is he going to be called up by the French national team anymore? Is he going to even be considered? But no, it's that's excellent to see, excellent for the league, so... That's something to keep Thanks to Ben Zemmer and the and the pawn bids. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> thanks to thanks to Ben Zemmer. <laughs> Karim Ben Zemmer. All right. Uh, also, uh, Carlos Vela and Diego Reyes are gonna be having a new coach. David Moyes. Uh, I'm sure t we we could have Tom. You probably could have had an entire podcast just to yourself talk about David Moyes and uh, and and uh, what your thoughts on him. But uh, yeah, he's no longer being in charge. Of real Sociedad anymore, so the players will be having the new coach. The interesting thing there is the reports. There's reports in the in the UK press that Vela was one of the reasons, and that he didn't get on at all well with with uh, Moyes and Vela didn't get on, and and Vela's such a big player at the club. I mean, his form's not been very good at all, yeah. has it really, over the last no, few no. months? Arguably, no, since since um, since Moyes took over, he's not really like kind of set anything to light. So yeah, so that's it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if Vela now picks up because. Mexico needs Vela. I still, I'm adamant that Mexico needs Vela because mm -hmm. for me, he's still potentially Mexico's best player, and by quite a bit, I think. I'm wondering what this means for Diego Reyes because it seems like Moyes put a lot of trust in Diego Reyes. He Diego did, Reyes went in, well. got a lot of minutes. Who knows what the next coach will really think of Reyes? Because you know, he, I, I don't. Reyes has been. He's been doing all right when I watch him play. He's been fine, but there's nothing that really makes him stand out to me. And I think boys put a lot of trust, and he's done, he's done all right. But who knows what the next coach will will do um, with it? Is um, other than that, I think uh, we're we're pretty much done. I'll be releasing the Mexico top twenty five soon. I'll uh, probably uh, hopefully this week. We'll see. I, I haven't we haven't really talked to the team. We'll uh, telling you guys who I, I want to say who won, who we selected for. Uh, to join the Mexican na at the Mexican national team. Oh my god, I, this tends to happen around the end of the Mexican soccer show podcast. I just start saying random stuff because I just want to finish. But who who's going to be joining the Mexican soccer show team? Because um, we put that post up uh, last week. We'll see who we dis who we're going to choose. Um, yeah, hopefully this week. We'll, but we'll keep you guys updated. Um, on that, any any final thoughts, Asorio, about a. Uh, MLS stuff about Mexico this Friday predictions cat stuff. I bring in my 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 cat here. I'll, I'll show you guys my cat really quickly. She's a she's asleep. Uh, 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 can you see her right there? Yeah, there you go. What? You got it like. <laughs> you oh, could you not see it? <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll go over to Andrea. That's her her final thought. She's got she's got her cat. All right, Andrea, yeah, you talk yeah. so, talk uh, about your cat for ten seconds, and I'm gonna grab mine. Uh, uh, well, everybody vote in the poll for Dulce. Uh, she's going up against uh, Cesar's cat, which is DJ Cuddles. Ooh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here's the final view of the cats. Let's see if they recognize each other. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's yeah, do it. yeah. Let's do it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> famous chemistry. I don't think famous that's chemistry. working. Tom, where's your cat, man? I know, Dude, cat. cat. Me. <laughs> Alright Tom, any final thoughts before we head out? No, just uh, thanks to uh, good old Afro Zander for doing the Twitter. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, I, li I literally asked him about a minute before the show started and uh, it looks like he's been tweeting, so huge, huge thanks to, everyone, to Afro. Everyone on the, 
on the chat, Antonio Ortiz, Ralph Sunder, Francisco Magaña, Omar Santos, Carlos Meyers, Steve Graff, Alex M, you know, always, uh, you know, a lot of comments from them guys, so yeah, thanks very much, always like uh, reading it as well, and it's uh, often very Yeah, funny. we read all the comments <laughs> after the show, if not during the show. Yeah, and I, it's actually, I'm actually reading the comments right now, and I see one that says, Cesar, <laughs> where is DJ? So I, 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 I followed through. I brought DJ. So for all, for all you people, I, it's actually pretty surprising. There's at least like six or seven people every time. Every every time they're just like, where's DJ Cuddles? Well, there you go. You got, you got, you got your DJ Cuddles this time. Some, some weird people out there, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks to everyone. Thanks to uh, everyone who's been following, who's been chatting. Be sure to follow, uh, to subscribe to the show. You know, just uh, there's a little red button right there, right next to you, know, you can see on the YouTube screen. Just click subscribe. That way, you can keep updated with all of our podcasts. Uh, follow us uh, on Facebook, Mexican Soccer Show. Follow us on Twitter at Mex Soccer Show. And uh, yeah, I mean, we'll probably be back next Monday to be discussing the results from Osorio's first game to see if you know he's gonna experiment. It seems like he definitely is. So let's see if he's going to get that positive result. Let's see if he is going to have a good first impression at the Estadio Azteca where there is a very, very fickle, fickle audience. All right, so thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks uh, to all the cats out there who have been watching. Um, and we'll be seeing you next week. <laughs>